Good day, two-wheeled brothers and sisters. Zach Kortz here with another episode of Daily Rider, the show where we ride around and we learn about motorcycles. On today's show, my very own motorcycle. That is a 2006 KTM 950 Supermoto. Basically a full-size V-twin engine, two wheels, a handlebar, and not a whole lot else. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about my riding history today, why I bought this bike, why I might recommend it, why I might not, if it'll do wheelies, Spoiler alert, it definitely can. So if there are enough dank willies, that's on me, not the bike. And uh, yeah, let's hit the road. <laughs> All right, team, here we have it. 950 Supermoto circa 2006. Uh, what specs can we talk about? No LED headlight, obviously. <laughs> no ABS probably obvious, but big stonkin Brembo binders. I think they're 305 mil rotors and um, big radial mount calipers, lots of brake. We'll talk about that. Uh, some dirt and grime on the underside of my fender. A little bit embarrassing, I guess. A bunch of carbon fiber bits that were on there when I bought it. <laughs> the first owner dragged it through the parts catalog. And yeah, here you got that big 942 cc liquid cooled V-twin. Uh, LC8 KTM engine um, and some aftermarket pipes which again I did not put on but I enjoy the sound of uh, yeah so there you have it 950 Supermoto I say we hit the road because as with most motorcycles riding it is the best part listening to it isn't so bad either it's got a nice little rip of thunder all right let's hit the road shall we Off we go. I bought this in spring of 2009. So yeah, more than 11 years ago now. But I always get a kick out of riding this bike. It's a real hoot. First red light. Might as well back it in. <laughs> this is gonna be a fun ride. Okay, now that we're rolling, we can talk about specs. So like I said, 942cc V-twin uh, makes, uh, I think it was a claimed 95 horsepower. It was new, about 60 foot-pounds of torque. It weighs about 450 pounds with a full tank of gas, which is 4.6 gallons. And when it was new, whoa, another uh, V-shaped engine over there. I was very excited. And when the 950 Supermoto was new, it cost 13,000 American dollars which is kind of pricey. We'll talk a little bit more about price later. And of course, we got to talk about seat height, which is 34.4 inches. No joke there. A pretty tall seat, <laughs> which has some benefits and some, uh, some problems. <laughs> All right. Half of the on-ramp was fun. That's something. Okie dokie, out onto the freeway. Now, in general, uh, Supermoto style machines are not very good on the freeway. And this 950 Supermoto is no exception, really. Um, it's fine as far as horsepower and the engine being smooth. I do get some, some vibes in the bar and a little bit in the pegs. Um, but in, in general, it's got kind of a nice pulse nice feel from the engine um, it just doesn't have any wind protection which is uh, you know was pretty obvious to me when I bought it and has been obvious to me every day since you sit up really high you know the seats almost 35 inches off the deck and it's pretty flat and um, there's basically no fairing at all so yeah you're just sort of a sail in the wind and when you cruise along at 65 or 70, it's not so bad. When you start going 75 or more than that, it can be a little taxing after a while. There's a couple of pieces of good news there. The seat is pretty comfortable though, and there's lots of legroom because the seat's so high. Uh, the foot pegs can kind of be located wherever they want and there'd be plenty of legroom. So at six foot two, I really appreciate that aspect of this bike. There's lots and lots of legroom. My knees never get cramped on this bike and my butt basically never gets tired because I think the seat's pretty comfortable. Range, if anything, is the thing that you have to worry about the most because um, it gets maybe 30, 35 miles to the gallon, realistically even, um, on the straight and narrow. 
So that means I can go maybe 140 miles is usually where I fill up. Uh, if I'm in a city, it'll be sooner than that. Uh, but yeah, basically, you know, less than 150 miles, you're gonna need gas, uh, which is a good break for your arms anyway, because you'll be tired of sitting in the wind after that amount of time, in my opinion. I've never done any really, really long trips on uh, this bike. I've done overnight trips and, uh, you know, long day trips, stuff like that. But it really does kind of represent freedom to me in more ways than one. Because I bought this bike when I moved to San Francisco in my mid-20s. I had never really had my own full-size street bike. I had just road raced for 10 years. That was all I cared about. I just wanted to, you know, be the next Valentino Rossi. And when it was clear I wasn't going to be the next Valentino Rossi, um, then I just kept road racing because I liked it or maybe I thought my luck would change. I don't know. The point is I really focused on racing and when I moved to California and bought this bike, it sort of exposed a whole different type of riding for me. It, it became um, a pastime like it is to so many other people. I took rides and just to go to a, a sandwich place that was 50 miles away and take pictures along the way and I was just really in love with the new place that I lived and with this machine. And I feel like that's the feeling that I get every time I get on it. I'm not distracted by anything. There's very little between me and the road, aside from the engine and the throttle. It's, it's a very rudimentary bike, and I feel very connected, um, partly because of the sentiment and partly because it's a simple bike and it delivers all of what motorcycling should be, in my opinion. Now that we're in this trucking area here, it's a good time to talk about mirrors. Got to keep your wits about you when you're in these uh, situations. And uh, the mirrors on this bike are pretty good. I've always thought they were kind of an ugly shape, if I'm honest. They're just kind of like droopy and organic. They look like a weird kind of like cyst or some kind of like, I don't know, thing that grew off the bike in an unnatural way. Um, it doesn't really fit the kind of angular style of the rest of the Kiska design that so many KTMs have. but. To be honest, they, they work pretty well. The bike, like I said, does have some engine pulse that goes through the mirrors a little bit. But in general, they're, uh, they're in a good spot. If they were a little bigger, they would be pretty close to perfect. But they're ugly. Oh well. Another thing worth mentioning, we're on the uh, open road here, is I did change the gearing on this bike. I went down two teeth on the rear sprocket, I think. Actually, was it one tooth? I can't remember. Anyway, I made the rear tooth, uh, the rear tooth. I made the rear sprocket, excuse me, uh, smaller so that I would get a little bit lower RPM at cruising speed on the freeway because I felt like that's what it needed and it has so much torque that I didn't feel like first gear needed to be geared quite that low. So I made that change to this bike. I often talk um, in reviews like this about how I would change gearing on bikes because I think that they're geared a little bit too tall or usually geared too short. Um, so some of you will be happy to know that on my personal bike I did just that. I geared it up to get a little bit better fuel mileage hopefully and um, a little bit less stress on the engine at you know 75 miles an hour on the freeway. I don't actually know if I've done the daily rider loop on my personal bike yet. So this is the this is where we find out if uh, clutch feel and balance is good. Try and clean all these stop signs, get the speedo to zero without putting your feet down. So far, Mr. Katoom is one for one. Balance on this bike is pretty good. It is very tall. Uh, so if you do, you know, if you make a mistake trying to do one of those um, footless stop and goes, then you can pay the price if you have a short inseam. I, um, I don't find the bike too ungainly because it's approximately as ungainly as I am. Clutch feel in general is also quite good. The hydraulic clutch is a little, a little bit different, I think. You just sort of have to get used to it. I don't think it's quite as direct as cable clutches in my personal opinion, but um, they don't need to be adjusted, which is nice. <laughs> so that's a benefit. And throttle response on this bike is quite good, I think. It is a little bit finicky and difficult to get used to at first because the flywheel is so light and it just, it has, it spins up so fast. Um, but it is carbureted. Uh, it's the last of the carbureted KTM V-Twins and I think the fueling is, is quite good. Once you get used to um, the kind of hair trigger, there's a little bit of garbage here. I'm gonna try and pick it up. Yeah, I got it. Plastic bag in a back pocket, a little bit of litter picked up. My good deed done for the day. Anyway, it is a sensitive throttle, but once you get used to it, it is quite predictable and really precise, which I really like. <laughs> uh, I'm the only vehicle at this intersection. Am I gonna get the green light? The motorcycle gonna not trigger the light? Come on, come on. 
need a car behind me. There we go. A hero in a Lexus. Maybe the first time anyone's ever said that. As we trundle through this neighborhood past the Corvette house, that's what I call that place, there's always at least one Corvette there. Someone's, someone's clean living. Anyway, as we trundle through this neighborhood, um, I would like to address one thing about used bikes um, that people asked me because this is mine, which is reliability. And I don't really know how to couch um, the reliability in a really, really precise way because I haven't owned that many motorcycles in my life, to be honest, on a, on a really long-term basis. But um, the fuel pump on this thing took a dump on me maybe 10, uh, eight years ago, something like that. And then I had to replace the regular rectifier uh, a few years ago, a couple few years ago, something like that. Other than that, it's been pretty good. I haven't had a lot of complaints. Um, the service I did at 9,000 miles was kind of expensive. Just took it to a dealer and dealers are expensive. I didn't really want to dive into valves and all that kind of jazz uh, because I'm not that confident a mechanic. So I paid someone else to do it. It was a little bit pricey, but worth it in my mind. They, you know, checked all the um, seals and valves and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, overall cost of ownership, not too bad. Reliability, it has never left me stranded because the two times it broke down, I was at home. So I guess I was lucky. Good time to talk about passenger accommodations on the 950 Supermoto. And uh, like many Supermotos, it's not wildly comfortable for the passenger. Um, although the seat's just sort of like an extension of the main seat, it goes back to the passenger. And uh, there's decent legroom back there because again, the seat's so high. Um, so you'll want a, a tall or an agile passenger to, to jump on with you. <laughs> um, the other thing is that there's no step in the seat, right? The seat's really flat. Um, and what that means is that your passenger probably won't be able to see over you unless they're quite a bit taller than you are. So something to keep in mind. Pretty good passenger accommodations. My lady friend likes this bike, but I think she just likes it because she knows I like it so much. And uh, I don't think it's necessarily her favorite to ride on. <laughs> Okie doke. Now we're into the twisties. And this is one of the reasons that Supermotors became so popular those years ago is that they're good at stuff like this. There's the wide handlebar and 17 inch wheels. They're often very, very direct. And that's exactly what this 950 SM is. Just one of the things I love about it so much is just it's very, very connected to the road. The suspension is um, too stiff for some people on the freeway. It's too soft for some people if you really want to hammer on it because it has to have eight inches of suspension travel basically. Um, but I find it to be a really good balance. The adjustability is nice and um, yeah, mostly just when you're when you're flicking through curves, you just have a really, really um, good planted feel from the, the front end and the whole chassis in general. I've never taken this bike to a racetrack and really uh, let loose probably because I don't know, it was my commuter for years. I rode back and forth across San Francisco to my office job for a handful of years. I put about 15,000 miles on it doing that. Um, it is at about 22,000 miles now, I think. Let's check. Where are we at? Fuel trip clock. What else we got? Yeah, 21.5. It had 2,200 miles on it when I bought it. And uh, yeah, so I think that's one of the reasons I never took it to a racetrack, just because it, it was my daily rider. Uh, and I didn't want to crash and mess it up. Plus I was enjoying motorcycling in this whole new way, like I spoke about before. <laughs> um, so anyway, I have wanted to take to a supermoto track though. I think it'd be fun to rip around a supermoto track <laughs> just to kind of see how it would handle. Um, it is huge and heavy, but I don't know. I think it would, I think it'd be fun. So I don't know, it's on my list. Hopefully I'll make a video about it when I do it. <laughs> oh my God. The engine on this bike, uh, like I said, last of the carbureted KTM V-Twins is a 75 degree V-Twin, which I think is just a, a nice number. Um, this engine always makes me think of the fact that KTM Austria is located on a map right between Germany and Italy, basically, or at least the, the western part of Austria is. And I always feel like KTM's across the board, really, but this is the first bike that made me think that 
is they're sort of a combination of BMW and Ducati. BMWs are very pragmatic and by the book, and Ducatis, of course, are very, very flamboyant and wild and loud. And I feel like this bike is somewhere in the middle. And I feel like that's a really a good, a good uh, place to sit between the sort of Teutonic nature of Germany and the sort of uh, flamboyant and wild Mediterranean side like, like Italian bikes always seem to have. So this engine falls in that category, makes lots of really good usable torque um, in a way that, uh, you know, an old BMW oil-cooled engine would. Um, but it also, when you spin it up, it just has a nice, it has, makes a nice noise and it pumps out quite a bit of power up top considering how much torque it makes down low. Red light, talk about brakes. See if we can stand it on its nose. Whoop, there we go. Big old stoppy. <laughs> Uh, I read some first rides of this motorcycle doing my research for this video, and uh, it was before I was a motorcycle journalist, so uh, anyway, one of the things that someone said was that the brakes were too touchy, too powerful, too much, they said. Um, and I wholeheartedly disagree. I think too much brake is exactly the right amount of brake, but I will say that I can understand the critique in so much as if someone was not really used to uh, superbike brakes or, you know, big, powerful um, dual rotor radial mount brakes that they might feel a little bit touchy. They have, they have a lot of bite. Um, yeah, word, the Ninja 3 Hundo. Um, so yeah, I, I can appreciate the critique of the brakes, but I think they're just lovely. I've always loved brakes that have tons of bite and are just really, really sharp because I think that's how I get the best feel. And uh, you know, big old stoppy. Can't complain about that. Oh, look out. Construction traffic. Holy smokes. While we're stuck in this little bit of traffic, I think good time to talk about another reason that I like this engine, which is that it's uh, kind of a puppy dog also. It's quick to rev, it's kind of sharp, um, and you know, ready to be rowdy, and it makes lots of good power kind of everywhere in the revs. But if you just want to putter around like this, um, you know, you're going on, going on a date night, or uh, <laughs> um, you're just in a polite mood, I suppose, it is really easy to use and gentle. And I think that that's something that KTM has carried forward in a lot of their bikes also. It's one of the reasons that the Super Duke is so good. Good segue to talk about bikes to compare to this bike. A lot of people asked about um, Ducati Hyper Motards, whether it's the old one or the new one, um, Aprilia Dorso Duro, um, and someone even asked about the Super Duke. So I will say that this bike, as it compares to the Ducati Hyper Motard, I think it was an 1100 dual spark in that generation. Does that sound right? Anyway, um, that bike was lighter than this one and I think claimed more horsepower. Um, and I rode one once a long time ago, uh, but it was very, very raw and visceral, kind of in the same way. This was just a, a velvety version of it, a smoother, creamier version of the Hyper Motard, in my opinion, which is one of the reasons that I like it. I never rode the Dorso Duro of that era, but Airy always tells me it was kind of a pud. <laughs> um, so I don't know, we'll take his word on that one. And uh, let's see, what else was there? Was a Speed Triple. Speed Triple of that era was a pretty good bike, and I did learn in my research that it was $3,000 cheaper, I believe, a Speed Triple in that era than this bike. So I don't know if you could really say that um, my 950 Supermoto was a, a great value of the era. I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, but I think as far as modern bikes go, it probably compares most, uh, most easily to a 950 Supermoto now, uh, Ducati, which is a, you know, it's a tall seat, uh, very sort of purposeful bike like this one. And it's one of the reasons I like the 950 Supermoto. Of course, that has all the electronics and, um, you know, sort of modern mumbo jumbo that bikes have, which is, you know, good for safety. Um, but I don't know, I guess I'll just stick with this guy for now. All right, about to get my bike all dusty. We're going down our little off-road testing route here. <laughs> Chugging along in first gear. Rap, rap, rap. <laughs> yeah, showing those KTM roots. See how it handles the sand. Yeah, not bad. Nice wide handlebar, little sketchy. But yeah, I mean, I would ride fast through this stuff. Maybe it's because it's my bike, but also, it's good. This is what you have a nice commanding riding position. You know, you're like up over the bike. The handlebar is wide. It's great. Let's hit a jump. Whew, yeah, it's a little sketchy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hit the big one too. 
Why not? Wrap. <laughs> oh, not even close to bottoming the suspension out. What a bike. Now time to find out if it can wheelie. No clutch. First gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear. How far do we want to go? How far do we want to go? We got to put it down. We're going to get in trouble. <laughs> and that is the final, the pinnacle of things that I like about this bike is that it is rowdy. It wants to wheelie. It wants to have fun. It's precise. It's direct. It's easy to ride whether you're on two wheels or one. I just love it. I just love it. Away we go from the stoplight. Another little willy. <laughs> so Zach's in love with his own bike. He thinks it's great. Good for him. He thinks the mirrors are ugly, but otherwise it's perfect. No, that's not true. Um, it definitely has its flaws. The seat height is really, really high. I mean, too high. A, a lot, there are a lot of people that if they said, should I get that bike? I would just say no. Um, and it's not very good on the highway. Um, it doesn't get very good gas mileage. It doesn't have very good range. And uh, if you have a small headwind, you're just going to be gripping the bars and <laughs> kind of holding on for dear life or tucking in like a spode. So yeah, it, it definitely it definitely has its flaws. Um, plus, it doesn't have any electronic stuff. There's no features. There's no ABS. There's no traction control. There's no cruise control. There's no electronic anything, really. It's electronic ignition. So I think that makes it pretty expensive for what it is, really. And you know, I bought it used um, years and years ago, and I'm sort of happy with it because it's delivered me so much fun. But uh, overall, I think. If I was gonna buy a bike right now, today, I probably wouldn't buy this. I'd probably scrape my pennies together and try and get a used Super Duke, to be honest, because I think the Super Duke, while it's not as good off-road as this bike, um, delivers a lot more in general. Okay, we're at the light and we can look at the dash. It's gonna be real quick, I promise. Uh, this is coolant temp on the left. This is speed in the middle, and that's about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a menu system down below, you can do. Uh, you can see fuel trip. It has a fuel light, no fuel gauge. Uh, it has trip meters and a clock, and an odometer. And that is it. Yeah, no, no, no tachometer, no fuel gauge. It is very, very basic. And uh, that's just another thing that I find kind of appealing about it. To be honest, is that it's uh, a very direct connection with with the road and with the experience, and isn't so concerned with features. So, yeah, there you have it. All right, got to wade through some traffic here, and then we'll be home. Bear with me. Look at this jack wagon riding around in a t-shirt. Oh wait, it's an officer of the law. <laughs> I never understood why motor cops ride in t-shirts. Doesn't make sense to me. But what do I know? And there's another police officer not signaling as they change lanes. We're two for two now on Daily Rider watching cops change lanes without signaling. Okay, you peeling off the off-ramp. Our fast chicane here. <laughs> yeah. Almost home. Official can you back it in test. Coming up. Here goes nothing. Oh, hex yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can definitely back it in and it's definitely good 950 supermoto yet another successful ride my friend good job <laughs> um, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning the sound of this bike is one of my favorites ever really I just think it's terrific hopefully you got enough of it along that ride and you learned something about this uh, motorcycle. And degreaser. Gonna give that Instagram post a like. Okay, I jumped into my social media post here. I'm going to jump through a few questions that you guys had 
hopefully add a little bit of perspective to this bike. John Acetra asks, you obviously ride many different bikes. What made you choose this as your bike? First, I should say that I bought this bike before I rode many, many different bikes. I was not in the motorcycle industry. I was not a journalist when I purchased this bike. And I lived in a uh, small, compact city, San Francisco. And I wanted something that I could get out of the city with on the weekends, but it would be fun as a city bike. So a Supermoto is a great option for that. Um, obviously, a big displacement Supermoto is good because it's got longer legs. So that was why I bought it. If I was going to do it now that I'm in my mid-30s and not my mid-20s, <laughs> uh, I would probably get something a little bit more practical that has a little bit more luggage, more wind protection, since A, I live in Los Angeles, and B, I'm just a more practical person now that I'm older. But that is why I purchased it. And in a lot of ways, that's why I still love it. Bryn Andrews, Brian and Bryn Andrews asks, why do you think KTM don't still make something like this? Good question. Um, I think KTM has probably just leaned into what's been popular and supermotors were very popular in the sort of mid 2000s and I think that's why this uh, blossomed and then you know now it's just uh, more super nakeds are the thing and you know they have the, the super duke which like I said the super duke aside from being a confident um, off-road-ish machine the super duke does everything this bike does it gets better mileage makes more horsepower is more comfortable has better luggage options is better at a racetrack I assume and so I just can't really blame them for doing that right and not building this bike anymore um i also think as much as i love this bike they didn't sell a ton of them so that could have something to do with it too <laughs> toast for days 10 asks do you miss any of the new tech on it good question because i did say i just love the simplicity of it and how great that is um but if i could pick two things i just am inventing rules now i would have cruise control and abs those are the two things I would have. Obviously, switchable ABS. I do think ABS is an excellent feature to have on a motorcycle, and it does make riding safer in general. So I would have that, and I would have cruise control because I think cruise control is excellent. Um, the only other thing would be heated grips, but my daddy-o gifted me some heated grips, uh, aftermarket heated grips years ago, and I installed them. I got a little switch on the dash there. So that problem's been solved. Um, but yeah, th those are the two things that I would, that I would want. We got a question here from S. Bleh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> I think I've answered your questions before because I remember that username. Um, how do you feel it in comparison on new similar bikes? I mean, is it still agile and powerful? Uh, yeah, good question. I think one of the reasons I still get a kick about riding this bike is that it is still valid from a performance standpoint. It is um, not as powerful or as light as some new bikes, sure, uh, but 100 horsepower and 450 pounds basically uh is a good combination for fun i think i mean like it has it does wheelies for days even though it's got like a 60 inch wheelbase and um yeah it still delivers the sort of rowdy fun that you get from a new bike for sure even if it doesn't have um quite the same punch as a bike that has 130 horsepower or would weigh uh, a few pounds less so i hope that answers your question i think it does deliver that Next up, Zadni has a question. Uh, we had a lot of questions about the 690 family. Zadni asks, how does it compare to the 690 family? So that's a good um, segue to talk about all this. If you want to know how it compares to the 690 SMCR or um, I don't know, lots of 690 based models. It is not as light. It is not as agile. It is not as super moto-y as a lot of those 690 models, in my opinion, um, but uh, it's kind of what I like about it. I like that it's big and brutish. Um, but yeah, I mean, a, a, a true, you know, like a Husqvarna 701 um, Supermoto or, you know, anything that's sort of with that uh, true Supermoto with that KTM 690 engine is going to be a little bit more pure than this bike from a Supermoto standpoint and a little bit more agile and, of course, lighter. Okay, we're almost done here. Daniel V. Delito, sorry if I butchered the name, says, Zach, I own a Japanese... <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I own Japanese motorcycles. That's what it says. He wrote it right. Jesus Christ. Zach, I own Japanese motorcycles all my life because I'm afraid the cost of complexity of European brands. Um, so this is basically a question about reliability and cost of ownership. And I think I basically addressed it in the ride. But what I can say is if it was a Honda, would the fuel pump have broken? Maybe not. Would the wreck have taken a dump? Maybe not. Um, to me, it's just a little bit of you know, you can chalk it up to European tax if you want to. I think it's worth it because I think it's more fun than um, a, a Honda 919 or something else that I could have bought uh, from Japan of the same kind of ilk. Um, that's my opinion. But yeah, I mean, if you want to be sure about um, reliability or, you know, you just really feel like buying Japanese is the way to do that, then I can't really fault you for that. 
Last question is from Connor M. Hill. Are your commute reviews coming back? They're back. Connor, that's another episode of Daily Rider in the books. We just got to rank this bike on the Daily Rider leaderboard. Um, so bear with me for two seconds. We'll be right back. We'll see how this sucker stacks up. Yeah, right. We're back in uh, Daily Rider headquarters, and we're here with the Daily Rider leaderboard, which means we got to rank that 950 Supermoto. Um, I got a nice little orange pin here. And I mean, that bike's really cool, right? Like maybe off the chart cool. Okay, fine. It's not that cool. It's, uh, it's a cool bike. It was expensive when it was new. It's still kind of expensive now for what it is. I think it's only fair to rank it above uh, the middle of the expense chart. I'm going to put it here. I think it's a cool bike, a little pricey for what it is, um, but I think that's a fair rating of my own personal machine. And then we're going to write KTM 950SM. All right, there we go. So it ranks, and then I got a little, uh, got a little strip here ready to go up on the board. It is going to go underneath the Kawasaki Versus 650 LT because it's not as good a daily rider as the Versus 650. It is more fun. It sounds better. It's a little bit cooler. I hope you agree. But all things being equal, not as good a daily rider as the Versus, I don't think. But um, still a proud place for my KTM to be on the DR leaderboard. I'm very happy about that. So there you have it, another show in the books, another bike ranked, wheelies were had. I hope you learned something, I hope you had fun, and we'll see you next time on Daily Rider. Hey, Alpine Stars van. <laughs> they don't see me wearing the scorpion jacket. How embarrassing. Time to go. Off we go, down Vermont Street. <laughs> Great engine. Great place to do it, down Vermont Street. I'm from Vermont, we'll give Vermont Street a honk. What, what?